The second very widespread myth regarding spirituality and science is the idea that the brain produces mind. Very often, it's taken for granted that the mind-brain relationship has been solved by science and that science has shown, has proved that the uh, brain produces mind. However, if we actually study in depth neuroscience and philosophy of mind, we will realize that actually one of the greatest problems in philosophy of science is exactly the understanding of the mind-brain relationship. Actually, we don't have a good explanation and well-accepted idea explanation about the mind-brain relationship. And one important philosopher of mind, David Schaumer, talked about the explanatory gap. There is an explanatory gap between uh, the third person perspective and the first person perspective of mind and brain. The third person perspective is the analysis of brain functioning. And this first person perspective is our subjective persp perspective of our own consciousness. And there is an explanatory gap between this. How can we bridge the connection between the brain functioning and the mind functioning? This is actually the greatest problem that we have nowadays. Perhaps the greatest problem in science and in philosophy nowadays. However, the materialists, usually they recognize that they cannot explain yet how brain correlates to mind or even how brain produces mind. But usually they say the following. We are almost there. We are almost finding this explanation. Just wait a little bit and we will be able very soon to explain how brain produces mind. Neuroscience uh, has advanced a lot, and probably in one decade, this generation, we will see the true explanation about how brain produces mind. This strategy has been called by the philosopher of science, Karl Popper, and the neuroscientist, John Eccles, as promissor materialism. The idea is that the, there is a promissor made by materialism that they will pay in the near future this explanation about how brain produces mind. However, it's okay, it's okay to, to believe, uh, to, to, to accept this promissor. But we need to understand that this is a promissor. It's not a scientific fact. The second important point is that Saul Araújo, a historian of philosophy of mind and historian of, of psychology from the Federal University of Juiz de Fora, he has published several papers uh, investigating the promissory materialism. And he studied in depth the, the writings from the French materialists from the 18th century and German materialists from the 19th century. What he found was exactly the same promissory materialism. So since the 1700s, materialists are claiming that they will very soon explain how brain produces mind, that science has advanced a lot, and very soon we'll be able to see how it works. So it's okay to assume, to accept this promissory, but we need to keep in mind that it has not been paid in at least 300 years. And, but what are the major evidence presented to support the materialist reductionism, the, redu the reduction of mind to brain activity? First, our narrow correlates if we have some brain, some mind activity, if I'm thinking something, if I make a decision, if I'm seeing something, there is a brain activation in some area of my brain. The second point is brain injury. If I have some damage in some brain area, there are some changes in mind manifestation. And third, brain stimulation. If I stimulate some parts of the brain, I, I, will have, I will hear some sounds, I will have some feelings, and things like that. So neurocorrelates, brain injury, and brain stimulation are usually the, the evidence, the definitive proof that brain produces mind. However, the same idea can be, the same evidence can be explained in a different perspective. Not only that brain produces mind, but also this evidence can be explained by another theory, a theory that brain is a filter or a transducer for mind, for mind manifestation. Mind 
is not produced by the brain. Mind is elsewhere, but mind uses brain to manifestate in our world. And this idea, this future model, has been also defended by several authors like William James, a philosopher and psychology who has been a pioneer in, in the study of scientific psychology. Just to make an uh, analogy, like a TV set. S we, when we are very young, when we see all the cartoons, all the movies, we think that all the characters are inside, they live inside the TV. We think that TV produces everything. However, later we realize that actually the TV is just a transductor. The TV program is produced elsewhere, is tra transmitted to the TV, and then the TV allows us to see the, the TV program. And if I damage the TV, I will not be able to see the program as well. If I s make some correlations between some electrical activity inside the TV with the image, I will also find correlates. But no nothing of this shows or implies that TV is the ultimate source of the TV program. The same idea is regarding mind and brain. So the neural correlates just to show that these brain areas are related to that, brain ac to that mind activity. Not that they are the ultimate source of that. The same the brain injury. I, I can, I, uh, in injuring some part of the brain, I'm I can be just in, uh, disturbing some part necessary for mind manifestation. At the same time, I the same thing is brain stimulation. If I have a stimulation in my occipital lobe, I can see lights. It doesn't mean that all lights that I see are just a product of my brain, that there are no lights in the world. But it shows only that the occipital lobe is related to, to, to vision. That's an important aspect. Mm -hmm.